right. So for a long time, there was little consensus in the literature as to how we should think of the concept of, of populism. Um, how we should define it was a question that gave place to very important debates going back all the way to the LSE debates in the 1960s. While the debate is still relatively ongoing and, and populism, in my opinion, is still an essentially contested uh, concept, it does seem that a majority of scholars and scholarship uh, are converging around what has been coined the ideational approach. So I was wondering if you could describe what this particular approach entails for you and how you see or define populism. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So first I should say when I, when I think of the ideational approach, I think of more than just a definition of what populism is. For me, an approach is more like a, a research program where it brings in a so kind of a theory about how the thing works, you know, what causes it, what its consequences are. And along with that, some ideas about how to, how to deal with measurement, mm -hmm. uh, methodological kinds of prescriptions that, that get attached to that concept. And so today when we talk about the ideational approach, I really, I really think you, you almost have to talk about all of those together. So having said that, um, let me give you first the definition. When we say ideational, we mean that populism should be understood in a, a minimal way as just a set of ideas. Uh, they may get spoken, people may express them in a survey, um, but at its heart, it's a set of ideas. And specifically, populism is... Um, and it gets, we have a few different labels we use, a thin-centered ideology, a, dis, a discourse or a discursive frame in which people think of or see politics as a kind of cosmic struggle between the will of the common people and an evil conspiring elite. And so, again, anytime people are seeing po uh, politics that way, talking about politics in a way that expresses that it's how they see it. That's what we call populism. It's those ideas. So now I, having said that though, uh, it's more than, you know, more than just a definition. There's also a sense of how it works. And I, Stephen, do you want me to go into that right now to say a little bit Please do. about yeah. you know, how it works? So um, along with this definition has come, I think uh, an, an attempt to, revisit and, and think more carefully about why people would come to support a populist leader, so causes of populism in that sense, and even also about consequences, you know, what, what would these ideas do and, and where might we see their effects most consistently. On the, on the causal side, because we see populism as a set of ideas, I think we, we more naturally gravitate towards really individual level kinds of theorizing to say, oh, okay, so first of all, both politicians and citizens would have these ideas that people would be supporting a populist politician because they like the populist ideas that that politician expresses. There's some kind of a congruence between those two. And so, um, then the question is, well, well, when? I mean, when do I, when do I like hearing politicians who say populist things? And our, our idea is that populist ideas as a kind of, and here it's probably better to think of it as a discursive frame, uh, because frames can be latent in people's minds. We can interpret the world a certain way. We can you know, have a frame that we use or not. And it's possible to have more than one frame in our mind that we can draw on depending on the context. So we start out by thinking of populist ideas as something that for most people are probably there, but maybe latent. And what activates them is some kind of a context in which I think that politics really is being controlled by an elite, that they're, that they're acting together 
in a way that harms me. And so we presume that that's going to be not just a policy failure, a significant policy failure even, but that it's going to be a policy failure that I can really I kind of realistically say is the result of intentional elite behavior. And in a lot of countries, that's going to be corruption. You can think of this as, you know, quick uh, momentary scandals, but I think populism is most common in countries where corruption is widespread, systematic. It's not just a scandal. It's something that goes on all the time. And so people, I think, very realistically see their politicians as often not acting in their interests and instead uh, kind of abusing their power of office to satisfy their selfish interests. And that's important because it goes against deep norms of citizenship that we have in democracy, that all of us should be equals before the law. Populism is ultimately uh, a way of expressing our, our, our anger at this, this sense that our equality before the law isn't being respected, that it's being fundamentally abused or ignored by our political representatives. And in doing that, they violated a trust. So, so if, if that's the kind of context where populism is possible, we can ask about a few other things. You know, when is it, you know, what kind of catalyzes this? And, and so the ideational approach sees some importance, uh, for example, to organization leadership, because I want to know that, um, that the populist ideas that, that this politician is expressing are part of a kind of a broader, credible uh, package of ideas and a an organization that could deliver once it gets into office. And so that, that matters too. Um, and it's also true that I think that, and, and we think that our research shows that the, the ideas are often catalyzed in the minds of voters when they're spoken by politicians. So I may, I may be upset about things as a citizen. I may be upset about what's going on. Policy failures may be hitting me. But it helps if a politician comes along and says, hey, you know what, this is why that's happening. And it's in that sense that we really can accurately call populism a kind of frame because the politician is saying, interpret your problems this way. And that's what, that's what a frame does. That's what we call a frame. Um, it's framing the issues. So, so given that set of causes, we think that there's some contexts that make populism more common. We think there are some organizational, some types of organization that commonly go with uh, populism and allow it to be successful. Charismatic movements are, are one of those. They blend really well with a large number of people who share their populist views, but otherwise may have a little bit of, um, you know, some disagreement, a little bit over ideology and issue positions. And having that charismatic leader makes it sort of easier to, to digest, to just accept the leader and what he's saying and, and let him embody the populist ideas and the will of the people. Uh, but it doesn't have to, and we know that populism can assume other organizational forms too. Um, so that, and, and again, it's interesting to think about how one can catalyze this to take people who might not be quite in the populist frame of mind, but, but then activate it by the things that we say. So, and then, as I said, there's a kind of methodology that goes with it. We're very concerned, obviously, with measuring ideas. We want to know how to see these ideas, um, you know, say in the words of a politician, and that's where things like speech analysis comes into play. Um, we also, though, think that those ideas can exist in the minds of citizens, uh, and that's an important part of the process by which we come to support populist politicians. And so, Things like survey uh, research becomes a, a really essential tool for measuring populism. And I, I we could go deep right now, and, and others have any other recordings about the peculiarities of populist ideas as we, as, as we define them, suggests also that there's some peculiar ways we might have to try to measure these. But that for me essentially is, is the, the ideational approach. It's all those things. It's that definition, but also a sense of how those ideas work in the minds of people and, uh, and then you know, more careful prescriptions about how we go about measuring and, and testing these ideas. So even though it's, let's, let's say that most people are starting to gravitate towards this particular interpretation of populism, not everybody does. There's still several definitions of the phenomenon that, that are out there. Um, how would you say uh, why 
why are there particular benefits to this particular approach to, to populism? You already hinted at, at it being an approach rather than a definition. Is that one of its core strengths? Yeah, I mean, for me, this gets at the idea that, I, again, really concepts don't just stand alone. I mean, I can define anything how I want to and measure that thing, but but we do it because we think that if I, if I cut things differently with a different concept, that it might suddenly allow me to explain or understand why things are happening here. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, sincere, in the spirit, I think, of these recordings and while you're doing them, I'll, I'll say a little bit about how I, came, how I came to this ideational approach, because I think it highlights the strength of the approach for me. Please do. Um, so I had been studying Hugo Chavez and his movement. I had, um, uh, for my dissertation, actually, this is a while ago, and I had um, spent a week or so interviewing uh, his supporters and was really fascinated. Did they, they this came at the end of a long experience in Venezuela where I had been talking to um, old party leaders from the traditional parties. And I spent months doing that. It was, uh, as you can imagine, it's sort of a tedious, challenging process uh, to talk to these uh, old politicians. And what struck me when I went to speak to the Chavez supporters was suddenly they were very different. They sounded, to my ears at the time, they just sounded really crazy. And they sounded radical, and it, and the the difference between them and the traditional politicians was so stark. But I didn't have a tool for describing or explaining that. And it was ironically, it was Kurt Veland who um, just a year or two after that invited me to to write up my thoughts about whether Chavez's movement was populist or not. And I told him, I you know, Kurt, I don't actually know what that word means. Uh, you know, my graduate training had never tapped into any of those readings and. And he recommended a few sources, his own work, the work of Ken Roberts, and then finally the work of uh, Carlos de la Torre. And so I, you know, I faithfully read those. I looked at Kurt's ideas, which, you know, he's outlined to you, the political strategic approach. And I thought, you know, it just doesn't really capture what made Chavez really different or interesting to me. It didn't seem to explain what I experienced as I had talked to his leaders. And I read Ken's uh, work and had a similar experience. I thought this just isn't really getting at the heart of this, whatever made it so strange, whatever had this, just this impact on me after I'd interviewed these Chavistas. And, and then I read Carlos de la Torre's work and it, and it completely surprised me first because Carlos was of course approaching this in a way that was not uh, quite from my positivist, rational choice, institutionalist tradition that I had been trained in. Um, one that focused mostly on uh, organization, it's certainly not on ideas. And, and there was Carlos focusing on ideas, using a very different kind of language to talk about it. And as much as foreign as it was to me, his approach, his definition was immediately right. I read this and thought, this captures Chavismo. It's what makes it sound so crazy, what seems to explain its behavior better than anything I've read so far. And and the ability of that, again, the point was that, it, that the, the concept kind of helped me see, oh, wait, this is what's really going on. This is what matters or what's important. And to think that it was the ideas of the movement that gave it that flavor that made it seem extraordinary, that seemed to motivate its members to do what they did. Uh, and so here we get it, you know, the idea of consequences of populism. I couldn't understand uh, Chavismo's consequences for Venezuelan democracy, uh, which were already evident in the early um, uh, in the early 2000s, without appreciating those ideas and in the way that uh, Carlos's uh, definitional work did. So, to me, the the strength of the ideational definition is that the the proof of it is: does it help me understand this thing better in terms of its causes and its consequences? If it does, then I think it's better, and I want to use it. And ultimately, then I, I think that's the strength by which we judge it. Uh, I mean, just using different people's measures, you, you'll inevitably say, oh, well, you know, I think they're populist and you don't think they are or vice versa. And, and there's no real way to adjudicate those because we're both reflecting different definitions. But 
I think it's more challenging when you can say, yeah, and I found, uh, say, that there's an incredibly strong correlation between uh, levels of perceived corruption um, using a variety of indicators and, and whether they have a populist chief executive or not. And to see that correlation emerge when nothing else seems to explain or, or to correlate with the presence of populism across the globe, to me, that's really astonishing and, and is an important kind of proof that, oh, yeah, I think this definition works because look what it just showed us. Okay. Um, you, you already mentioned some of the other Latin Americans who were at the foundation of some of the writings on populism like Kurt Whelan, Ken Roberts, etc. Um, they typically tend to, as you said, fall into the more political strategic uh, interpretation of, of populism. And they would argue that um, the ideational approach as a whole kind of overlooks leadership, overlooks the, the importance of charisma of a leader and the role that the leader him or herself plays in the populist phenomenon. Is that a valid criticism for us to consider? I, I think that's, I think that's a, a partially helpful way to think about it. Clearly the definition we're offering is, is, is a minimalist definition. It really does just focus on these ideas and is interested in how the ideas, you know, whether they're being spoken or deployed or activated. And, and so, yeah, there's a clear focus on the ideas at the same time, I, I think Kurt is right to say that, you know, if this is all you look at, that's not really interesting. I mean, we need to connect it to other aspects. So as I've already done talking about, say, context, you know, well, what about the context would make these ideas resonate? Um, likewise, I've mentioned the, the importance of organization and thinking how organization would condition the, the impact of these ideas. You know, are these going to become successful? Are voters going to listen to it? Or are they just going to kind of ignore it? Um, and so where leadership fits in, and, and Kurt is right in the sense to, to focus on uh, charismatic movements, because this is the organizational form that the most successful populist forces assume, the ones that, you know, win a lot of power and take control of government and, and transform uh, their countries. And, but uh, our point is, is to say that, yeah, but that's a, that's a separable thing. It's contingent. So not all populisms have to assume that organizational form. Uh, they can instead take the form of really it's something more like an, an institutionalized party structure where the charismatic leader is not as strong or it might even come in the form of a grassroots movement that doesn't have a charismatic leader. We've got examples of all of those. If I think about the Tea Party in the United States as a, a, a kind of populism, a manifestation of it, but the Tea Party, um, yeah, I think really uh, throughout its history, because today we think about, you know, Trump being supported by former Tea Party supporters, and that's true, but as a movement, I don't know if the Tea Party was really that significant when Trump finally comes along. And certainly the movement when it starts in the uh, kind of, you know, around 2010-ish, 2009, it doesn't have a single charismatic leader, uh, but it does have the rhetoric. And the rhetoric then seems to drive it and gives it a certain quality that makes it interesting and maybe a little scary. And, and we miss that if we say, oh, it, it, has to be, uh, it has to be a charismatic movement or it doesn't count. Um, where we do want to bring that in, though, to acknowledge, I think, you know, Kurt's point and that of other Latin Americanists who often emphasize this, they're tending to look at the most successful populist movements, which do have charismatic leaders, and they are movements. Um, and we think there's a reason for that. And, th and again, I, I think thinking about the ideas helps you appreciate why this kind of organization would seem to associate itself with the most successful forms. And this gets at Laclau's idea that um, really, this is, there's a lot of disparate wills out there. You know, what I think is the will of the people, and what you think it is as citizens. And to somehow come together and organize when, first of all, we have maybe very different ideas about what the will of the people embodies, but also when we're also kind of 
opposed to this in principle, this idea of, you know, I don't want an intermediary here. I don't want a, a party that stands in for me. I want to have some direct connection as part of the will of the people, governing and directing and being politics. And how can you do that? I mean, organizationally, how do you embody that and make it work? And a charismatic movement's a really good way of doing that because, again, there's the sense that we're all in it. We're all kind of level uh, organizationally. There's not a hierarchy here. Um, and what unites us is our affection for our belief in this leader that we think in some sort of almost quasi divine way embodies the will of the people and articulates that in a way that really satisfies us. And, and so then we kind of don't concern ourselves for, you know, well, yeah, but what exactly positions does he have here? And I may not like all of them, or, or I, maybe I should be troubled that he hasn't articulated a really clear set of, of policy positions, a really clear program that he follows faithfully. No, that's okay. I think he embodies my will. Let's go for it. So, so that's, that's pretty powerful. Um, so again, I think what the, the political strategic approach does is it points us to some common organizational features of successful populist movements. But I don't want to make that definitional because otherwise I'll miss all these other populist phenomena that are out there and, and, and maybe not think about how the organization connects to the ideas. So I think that's something that the ideational approach uh, tries to do is to think, well, how does organization connect um, if it's not definitional. So if we then focus on those ideas by themselves, there are some scholars like Michael Frieden, who a couple of years ago wrote a piece on the teen-centered ideology, saying very specifically about populism that the center and the, the ideas are so incohesive and that there's no internal cohesion that we shouldn't really look at it as a set of ideas because they're so fluid. We can't even think of it as a thin-centered ideology. How does that align with uh, the idea of populism as a set of beliefs? Well, um, in a way, you could say this is a battle over, over, over terms and labels. Um, now, this is a hard battle because Michael Frieden is the one who, I think, invents the term thin-centered ideology and to say, oh, well, you know, you're wrong. You don't know what that word means. It, uh, we, we do think it applies to populism. That's, 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 you're, on, you're on tricky ground there. That's, that's really hard to do. So and if we, if we then take a step back, basically, if Michael Frieden's argument is, no, there is no internal cohesion, what would for you then be the actual internal cohesion? What would make it a set of actual beliefs that people can tangibly adhere to? Yeah, so let me say here, I think, I think in a way, uh, actually, I agree with Michael Frieden. And, and I think to a point, Kasmuda would as well, in that he would say, you know, you're right, we've argued all along that populism has, it, it's, not a, it's not a very uh, comprehensive, programmatic, <laughs> this is not a, a traditional ideology. And that's uh, why Cassis often said, and, and we like to cite this idea that, um, you know, populism is, is maybe at best a kind of a, a host ideology. That, well, the, the idea, again, that's a little tricky because we're wanting to use the word ideology there. The point is populism doesn't offer a, co, a, co, a, a comprehensive set of programmatic solutions like a traditional ideology does. And at some point, you do have to offer that as a politician and, and as a citizen, you do want to know a little bit about what exactly you're going to do when you get in office. And that's why we have left and right uh, populisms and, you know, there are arguments about why those, those are more appealing or why or right populism or left is more appealing in different countries. The point is that populism doesn't fill in what an ideology traditionally does. And so uh, if we compare populism, say, to something like environmentalism or feminism, which is what Frieden does traditionally, he uses thin-centered ideology to refer to those ideologies because he's wanting to say, you know, they got a lot missing, but they are still kind of ideological in a qualitative way. And I think what we're saying here is actually populism, qualitatively speaking, is not an ideology. I mean, it is not consciously 
created in the way that the classic ideologies are. And it is not designed to speak to all kinds of issues. It just doesn't do that. It speaks to a fairly narrow set of issues, mostly uh, what we think of as, you know, our notion of sovereignty, you know, who, who is the rightful sovereign of our, of our political community and what's the relationship of that sovereign to, you know, other actors. And that's what populism is about. And so at the end of the day, if we think about the consequences populism has, one of the reasons it lacks a lot of, um, predictable, clear programmatic consequences because it doesn't have a fixed position. The one it does matter for the most, as far as we've seen, is democratic institutions. But to me, that makes sense because populism is a claim about democracy, how it's not working and how it should. And so not surprisingly, that is where it seems to have its most consistent effect across populisms of the right and the left. So in that sense, I actually agree with Michael Frieden um, but having said that, then it becomes a kind of battle over the labels. At, at heart, uh, people who use the ideological or the ideational approach, sorry, are, are really all saying it's the same kind of thing, uh, whatever the label they want to use. And, and of course, there are other debates out there, too, whether this is going to be, you know, a style, for example, um, or a discourse in the sense that the cloud talks about it. And... Um, and, and, and not to minimize some of the, the differences that there are among people using this approach, but at the end of the day, we're all talking about a very similar set of ideas that are qualitatively different from traditional ideologies that are consciously articulated and much more comprehensive. Okay, so if we then, as a final step, if we take, you know, we go away from the conceptual a little bit and we look more at the empirical, differences between some of the conceptual descriptions of populism. A um, lot of authors go back and forth about using different definitions, saying, you know, but this is populism and that is populism and this is not populism, etc. Is there a particular case that another approach would classify as populist, but that according to the ideational approach, we wouldn't necessarily uh, consider populist. Yeah, Stephen, that's a, that's a great question. And I think you phrased it nicely. I, I think in practice, as we've gone around, you know, measuring populism uh, in the sense of ideas, we've, we've tended to find that we, we end up with a, a set of populists that's usually more restrictive than uh, than traditional lists, uh, you know, so people who would get included in other people's definitions are mm -hmm. sometimes not included in ours. They don't make the cut. Um, and it's a little rare to see the other thing, to find someone that nobody thought of as populist, but, oh, wait, you know, we did. There are some cases of both, though, so I'll mention one of each, from, and I'll give them from Latin America. Um, a, a case of a populist who's not, we would say, not really a populist, is Alvaro Uribe in Colombia. So former president, still politically active. Uh, in fact, at the time we're making this recording, he's, uh, he's, he's being charged for uh, some uh, corruption in his country. Uh, but, but he's so an important figure. And often during his presidency, he's uh, coded in, in some other databases that use something more like a political strategic definition as populist, because he does seem to have some qualities, uh, if not charisma, at least is a very personalistic leader, uh, seems to be at the head of a movement. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's a bit of a maverick, uh, broken with his party and creating something of his own. So, populist. And that's a tricky one, even for the political strategic approaches, because they have to admit that his rhetoric was not it was not what we think of as populist rhetoric and what even a political strategic approach thinks of as populist rhetoric. But because they have several components and he meets a couple of these, they, they're willing to let the rhetoric go and count him. And we would say, no, not so fast. You can't do that. They, those other attributes, the leadership kinds of attributes are not the important ones. It, it is the rhetoric that matters. And he doesn't have it. I mean, he's, he's if anything, he's elitist uh, in his rhetoric as we've measured that. And that makes sense. I mean, he's not approaching this by saying that Colombia's problems are 
the result of a conniving elite that's defrauded the common people. It's sort of the opposite of that, you know. It's uh, leftist guerrillas and their allies have weakened us from within, and and we who know what we're doing need to come together and rescue our country. And so it's just kind of a mixture of elitism and maybe some patriotism that we find, not a populist rhetoric. And so we don't we don't count him in those. By the way, his consequences for democracy then um, are, are more in line with what we would have predicted. We would say, well, not being a populist, I'd be really surprised to see him rolling back systematically, you know, these institutions like civil liberties or, uh, you know, the, the quality of elections. And, um, and, and yeah, we really don't, I mean, this is not Th th those aren't things that Colombia experiences under Alvaro Uribe, you know, whether or not we agree with his, with his policies or his approach to, uh, to, um, to the guerrillas in his country. So, so that's, that's one instance where we would say, no, not a populist. On the other hand, there is a, there are, and there are a couple of these where we say, actually, they're really populist and you didn't know it. So one of those is Salvador Allende in Chile. And uh, partly because uh, Latin Americanists have had this kind of unwritten rule, which is no Marxist can ever be considered a populist because we just know they're different. And in fact, Marxists have often criticized some historical populists because they, they seem to compete with them or steal their votes and support away from, from orthodox Marxists. And they've always been frustrated by that. And we'd say, actually, Salvador Allende, if you look at his... Uh, rhetoric during, you know, that 1970 campaign when it comes to power, and then after as the country polarizes. It's astonishingly populist. He talks all about uh, the, the good common people of Chile and how they've been uh, defrauded by the, the systematically corrupt actions of the capitalist elite and, uh, and the traditional parties that represent them. So it's an incredibly polarizing rhetoric. And as you read his speeches, you realize, oh, this is why the country became so divided. And you can see how they could end up with a coup in 1973 with this very strong populist rhetoric. And so again, uh, because of the unwritten rule, never considered a populist, but as we looked at his rhetoric systematically, it was very clearly there and began to make sense, help us make more sense of, well, we'll you know, does Marxism lead inevitably to this kind of, you know, military coup? And maybe not, not if it were expressed in, in, in a less radical way than he did. Uh, it, was, it was a very divisive rhetoric that he used, and it did divide his country. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this very insightful sneak peek into the ideational approach to, to populism. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh,